Heavenly Father, we're just here to glorify your name, uh, to study your word, to hear the lessons that you have for us, Lord. We thank you for the praise for Teddy here that she went through that and, and you were with her all the way, Lord, like you are in everything we do. And that's part of the message, Lord, that we face things in our lives, but yet we can always look to you for our help and our strength. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I say your name right, Teddy? Yes, you did. Okay. That is one D I E. <laughs> one, one D and I E. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so today the title of this message is "Lift Up Your Eyes," and we're gonna I'm gonna start by reading Psalms 112 or Psalms Psalm 112. The entire psalm is only eight verses. I'm sorry, not 112. 121. <laughs> So Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall never either slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from, from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out, your coming in, and from this time forth and even forevermore. That says a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. But I'm going to take us back to our childhood real quick in here. Have any of you ever played in the sandbox? Yeah. Maybe you had one and you played in one. And you remember all those things you used to do in there? And you, would, you know. So the story today is, is a little boy was in the sandbox. And he had his little truck. You know, he had a shovel. And he would put dirt in this truck. And he had a little road going over here. And he'd dump the dirt over here. And... You can picture doing all these things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you built, sand castles or whatever you did, but this boy was digging in the sand, and, and as he was shoveling the sand, he, he hit something hard in the sandbox. And he thought, well, you know, this is supposed to be sand. It can't be something hard in my sandbox. So he takes his little shovel and digs around, and all of a sudden he realizes that there's this, this good-sized rock in the sandbox. And he doesn't want it in there, obviously, because it's not going to work with what he was doing. So he kind of starts moving dirt around the sand, this rock and getting the sand back and exposing this rock. And it was a pretty good sized rock. And this boy was only about eight or nine years old, not too big, not too strong. And so he finally gets this rock and he, he's determined to get it out of the sandbox. So he, he, he kind of gets under it, he gets it rolled over to the side of the box. And you know, you can picture the sandbox with the wood things around the, the, the frame and then a little place to sit on top of it. You know, you can just picture this in your mind, this, this boy struggling with this rock. And, and he kind of gets it over there and he kind of figures out that if I can put some sand under it and, and kind of get it up a little bit at a time, I can get it rolled out of my sandbox. And so he gets over there and he, and he gets up and he, and he kind of tries to lift it. He can't do that because it's kind of too heavy. So he, he digs his, some feet holes in or places for his feet to get. And he gets under it and he, and he gets, gets kind of down so he can get it up and he can move his hand to the bottom and, he, and it's getting hot. And he's starting to sweat. And, and, dust and the mud or leaving streaks on his face. You can picture this boy. And he gets it up here and he gets it almost up to the top of it. And he's pushing with all his hands he, and his legs and, he, and it slips and he tries to catch it. He tries to catch it and it smashes his hands and skins up his knuckles. At that point he had just worked in this rock in a hot sun for <coughs> way too long and he kind of just had tears coming down mixing with the sweat and his mud in his face and he's sitting on the edge of the sandbox just defeated just defeated as he's sitting there threatened over this rock he feels this cool shadow coming over him as he looks up he sees his, his dad standing there blocking the sunlight and the father asks the son well what's up son what's going on he says dad you know i i, I was playing in my sandbox and and I hit this rock, and this rock was in my way, and I, I worked so hard, I can't get this rock out, and it's frustrating me, and I'm, 
I tried with everything I had. And his dad says, well, son, have you used all your resources? I says, dad, I used my legs, my feet, my arms, my shovel. I did every, everything I had I used on this rock, and I, I can't get it out. And his father said, well, you know, son, I was watching you from the kitchen window. And I was available to you to help you if you would just call up. And at that, his father reaches down and gets his good-sized rock and tosses it out of the sandbox. And that sandbox is a picture of our lives. We all live in a sandbox where we have rocks that occur in our lives. And in the sandbox could be our community, our, our work, our church, our family. And as we go through our lives, we run into sand rocks that are just, they interfere with what we want to do. You know, our plans. And when we normally run into a rock, what do we want to do? We want to tackle it our way, right? Like this boy, he was focused. He was playing with this little truck and shovel and stuff, and all of a sudden his rock came up and it took all of his attention, took all of his focus. But in our lives, that represents our, that sandbox. Christ told us in John 16, 33, he says, I have told you these things that in me you have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen. You know, our nature is to control things in our lives. And as I look through this, this story and this picture, I see that, you know, we all have a throne in our life. Have you ever seen that book called The Four Spiritual Laws and it has Christ and then a throne there and Christ should sit on that throne. You've seen those? Well, I, I remember when I was a younger at home, we lived on a farm and we had a, uh, a farmhouse. And it wasn't a big house, but it had one main heater in the house. It was a floor heater. You guys remember those floor heaters growing up? Yeah, some of you may or may not. And if you stepped on the, the grate, it would leave a pattern on your foot. You know, so you, you didn't want to do that. But see, I grew up with three sisters, one older, two younger. I can remember getting up early in the morning, wrapping that blanket around me and getting out and <laughs> surrounding this heat and all that, that warm air would just come up and, and it was like you were sitting on a throne. It was like, oh, it's all mine and I can just enjoy it. Well, that was great until one of the sisters got out. And then I could maybe just take half of it and she could take half of whoever was there and we could both enjoy it until the next sister got out. <laughs> and I can remember all four of us having knocked down, drag out battles over the best spot on that heater. And if we could get someone moved over, put her foot on it, that would be the great thing. But, but you know, that's how our throne is, right? Isn't that that we struggle with Christ? We struggle with our own desires on the throne of our life? Because we want to be there. We want the best spot. Think about that. And think about... How many times when we face those difficulties, those rocks we come into, that we, we start blaming other people? Or we start regretting what we didn't do in the past? We go into damage control or problem solving, or like this little boy was figuring out ways to get that rock out. We might even go into worry, worrying about this rock, all these rocks, they all come at one time, and one right after another. And, and worry, you know what worry is like? Worry is like a rocking chair. I was reading this other, it says, you know, it gives you something to do, but you, know, you don't get anywhere, right? You just, it doesn't do anything for you. And when we try and deal with those rocks in our lives, we end up smashing our own fingers, don't we? Making the wrong decisions, making quick decisions, instead of waiting for the Lord. I remember when we, uh, we moved to Montana about eight years ago, eight or nine years ago, and, and we were at a nice church, but our grandkids had moved to Stevensville. We were in Post Falls, Idaho, and we would come over and visit. We were driving home, and every time we drive home, we said, what? what's keeping us from living over there and enjoying the grandkids? And I thought, well, you know, what we should do is let's just pray about it. Well, we brought it to our church family. We had them praying about it, and and then my daughter's church over here, Lone Rock Church, was praying for us to get, move over. So we thought, well, we would just, you know, kind of lay a fleece out for the Lord. So we interviewed some realtors, and we talked about a price, and we 
And this was early spring. We thought, well, we, if we list our house now, higher price, we got all summer to sell or not sell. We didn't have to move, but we really wanted to. And so we thought the Lord would be able to answer that, obviously, because he's God and we're not. So within seven days, we have a full price, no contingency offer in our house. And I'm thinking, oh, my damage control. Here's a rock. I mean, you know, I wasn't ready for this. I thought we had all this time. And so what does Marvin do? He's a, he's a list maker. So I start taking control. I said, Lord, thank you for answering the prayer for selling our house, and I'll take it from here. <laughs> have you ever done that? Have you ever done that? So I'm starting to make a list, and I, and I think, well, let's see, we, we, we need this, and we can't do that, and we don't want to sign a lease on a house because we're going to rent for a while before we bought. And we can't sign a lease until we have our check because if you get involved with something, you don't have the money, things happen in real estate, you know, and I see somebody probably done that or been there, right? <laughs> so, so I have all this, and, and Marvin's trying to juggle all these A, B, C houses and stuff, and I had my daughter enlist in the finance of place, and, and I squandered six weeks out of eight weeks escrow, or escrow, fussing with it myself. And we got to where I was driving over on Sunday evening to work during the week, and I figured, well, Susan should certainly pack the house herself while I was gone, <laughs> and that didn't work very well. And so, so I was driving over one night, and I knew I was out of time, and I hadn't really found a place, and I was just, I was uncomfortable because I had taken on what, what God said he would do. And so I pulled over on the side of the road, driving over one night, and I took this list, this to-do list of probably 30 items where to live, how to store stuff, what to do. I just crossed off to do and I put God's list, God's name on the top of that list. And I said, and all the way over here I had another hour or so to drive, and I said, everything on the list, I just ignored. Every single thing. And I said, I don't want this back. This rock's too big. And I fouled it all up. So I get over here, and, and Whitney, my daughter, says, well, you know, I see the grandkids. They were, like, young at that age. And, and she says, well, Dad, look what I found on Craigslist. Because she was looking for me, and she looked at this, and I looked at this ad on Craigslist, and it was, like, two months old. The, the phone number was L.A., California phone number, and I'm thinking, and it was really cheap rent, beautiful little place on an estate, and I'm thinking, it's probably a scam. They'll take your money and never see it, and that old of, of an ad is certainly not still available. That's what I thought. But I said, Lord, I'm not taking it back because I had plans to do all these things, and I didn't want to screw another thing up. So I called the guy. It was late at night, and he says, oh, yeah, it's been for rent for a long time, but I'm not the owner. I'm just taking applications for my girlfriend, who's the she's a doctor, and she owns it. And... Uh, uh, so I'll send you an application. So he faxed me the application. I filled it out that night. About midnight, I tried to send it back. Fax machine doesn't work. And so I said, well, okay, next day I'll call and make sure I wrote the number down right. So for the next three days, I can't get a hold of this guy, and the machine has not taken my fax. So I figured, well, now I had from 10 days, now I got seven days to close this escrow. I said, Lord, I'm not taking it back. I said, we have to live in a car. We will trust you. That's part one. <laughs> so part two. You know, at, at any given moment when we face things in our life, we have the resources of God. At just a whisper of a prayer or the bending of our knee, we have him. In Psalm 121, 1, it says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come from. Our help, our help, my help comes from the Lord and make heaven. That's where we need to look. Not on our to-do list or things that we want to do. That's where we need to look. And it teaches us to comfort ourselves that his almighty wisdom and his power it's just like that father watching from the kitchen window as we kind of fuss around with our lives and 
fight these rocks on their own. He's watching us, waiting for us to ask him to help. He never sleeps, it says in verse 4. And in verse 5, it says, under God's grace, we can rest in his shadow. But sometimes we wait until we're all sweaty and bloody and dirty and tired until we realize it. Yeah, I miss that. But it's never too late to turn. So let me ask you a question. What do we Christians miss when we don't do that or we continue to work in our own wisdom? Like, I had a plan A, B, and C, and if I had a, before I waited and turned it back to the Lord, if I had done something, I would have been locked into something that I shouldn't have been locked into. And then I would have missed all those things because God works in the background. When we're fussing with these rocks in our lives, he's preparing stuff to answer our prayer. But if we don't wait and be patient, we miss all that. In Joshua chapter 1 through chapter 8, there's a little story I'm going to paint for you that ties right into what we're talking about. Your assignment is to read Joshua 1, chapter 1 through chapter 8. It's a, it's a neat story. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. So here it is, Joshua. Remember all that, Joshua, that the battle of Jericho. Remember that song? Well, here's the real story, or the rest of the story. <coughs> so the Israelites are coming out of the desert. After 40 years, because of the non-belief, all those guys that, except for Caleb and Joshua, who didn't believe in the Lord, are gone. They come across the Jordan River, and not only that, but God backs the water up 15 miles up to Adam. 15 miles he blocked this water in it, and it piles up back there. You've got 2 million people approximately coming through on dry land. They camp at Gilgal. That's their camp. Joshua or Jericho is two miles away. Now let me give you a little mental picture of Jericho. Jericho was the oldest or a very ancient city and it was built on a hill. Okay, city on a hill. Then they built a wall around that city. Then over time they built another wall. This is a double walled city. I don't know if you knew that. And between the main wall and the other wall, they filled in here. And so people lived on the outer wall, kind of like the, the outer city. And Rahab, remember Rahab? who helped the spies, she lived on that outer wall. That's where her house is. So when they went out, they went down the outer wall. This is in the story, you gotta read it, okay? So, this is the story about obedience in Joshua's life, disobedience, and then obedience. We all have done this. So Joshua, when he faced Jericho, he says, what are you gonna do, you're gonna go around once a day for six days, right? And the seventh day, you're going to go around about seven times and you shout and blow the trumpets. And this was about a mile around the city. That's how big the city is. Obedience. They do that. What happens? They blow the trumpets, they shout, and the walls come tumbling down. And it says in, the, in Joshua, it says that the people walk straight away into the city. Now, how do you do that when you have 40, 50 foot tall walls? Well, as they fell, it created a ramp into the city. Now the interesting thing, in the archaeological digs, there's one part of the outer wall that didn't crumble down. I wonder if that was where Rahab's house was. Study that and look into this. This is fascinating. Obedience, victory in Jericho. The next city that the Israelites are going to conquer is called the city of Ai. I call it Ai or I, whatever you want to say. But instead of falling to the Lord and trusting the Lord like what I did, I was going to drive my own car. Joshua says, and the people of, of Israel said, you know, we, he sent spies out to the city. And they go out and they look and they say, well, there's only two or 3,000 people there. You don't need to bother all of the armies. Just, just send a small regiment of two or 3,000 warriors to conquer this city. Well, they didn't know it, but all the men of the city were gone, and they didn't see them all. So they listened to man and man's wisdom, and Joshua doesn't consult the Lord. They send out two or three warriors to attack the city of Ai, and they get whooped. And they come running, they get chased back, and Joshua's, oh, Lord, what have we done? We've hurt your name, and all these people will will think they can beat Israel. And, and what does God say? He says, Joshua, you got sin in your life. You got sin in the camp. 
sin in your camp. It was Achan who had stolen some things from Jericho, buried it under his tent. He dealt with it. You've got to read the story about how it was dealt with. And now you have the obedience. God says, okay, here's how we're going to take the city of Ai. You're going to take 5,000 men. You're going to run around the city at night. You're going to camp over in this little valley that the city can't see. And then in the daytime, you're going to take a small regiment of three or 4,000 men, and you're going to go out to the front of the city and let them see you again. And when they come out after you, take off running. God's plan, God's way. They do that, and they run. They chase. Here comes the Israelites back for the second whoop, and let's go get them, guys. And the whole city empties to chase these guys until Joshua sees the city in the background burning. And the people of Ai, the king of Ai, and all the warriors turn around and they lose heart because they realize what had happened. These 5,000 people hid in the valley, came in, piece of cake, God's way. Obedience, victory, disobedience, failure, obedience, victory. So the second half of my story. This house, of all the 32 things I had on my list to do, met every one of them. We had a three-car separate garage for storage, all my, all my equipment and construction stuff. It was a five or 600 square foot guest, guest house on an estate with a big two-car garage. and had everything that was on my list. And as I went out, I finally got a hold of Kurt. He says, well, you know, I don't know if it's rented or not, but just go out. She's up there today. Go out and see her. That's what he told me to do. So I go out and knock on the door. And the lady's Donna. She's about this tall. She's a doctor. She travels through. And she says, oh, yeah, well, you know, no problem. Come on in. Let's talk. So I sit on this chair, vacant house, one chair, and she's behind the counter. And I'm sitting here telling her story. Sold her house. I, mean, I, don't, I can't sign a lease until I get my check up front. And she says, uh, after about five or ten minutes talking, she says, well, okay, the house is yours. And I said, in my heart, I said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you know, because we were supposed to close July 4th, or move July 4th. This is like... Well, I could put almost July 4th. It's about five days before we had to move out. And she says, and here's the thing. What she said was says to me, she says, you're the first person I feel that hasn't been lying to me. So when I was doing my own thing, God was preparing his answer in the background. And he gave her wisdom to know her or discernment to know not to rent to these people because he had that house for us. Now, of all the 32 things I had on my list, he met every single one of them, but one. And I didn't have it on my list, he had it on his list. I had budgeted like $18 a month, or $1,800 a month for living, rent, and storage, and all that stuff. But with this house, he answered all the storage needs. The rent was, it's $500 a month because we were supposed to take care of the estate, mow the lawns, do all that stuff. But she also wanted to do a lot of work in the house. So she used me, and I worked off the rent to do painting and whatever else in the house to do. In three years, we had budgeted like $60,000 in rent. We actually paid less than six months rent, $3,000 for three years of living in And the thing is, is that's what we could lose when we circumvent God's timing. We fuss with those rocks so long in our lives that we miss his better answer than we could ever understand or expect. In Psalm 121, the psalmist is painting a picture of a traveler coming home, seeing the hills of Jerusalem and See, and that's where my help is. As we lift our eyes to the Lord, we know that our home is not here. Amen. Our home is eternity. Mm -hmm. When you think of eternity and you think of the little problems we deal with here, they don't even compare to eternity. They're here and they're gone. Mm -hmm. So our eyes should be on eternity. Okay. You hear, remember the song, you all know the song, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. Know that song? Mm -hmm. Let's sing it 
in unison. Without music, just, it's very simple. Really? Ready? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We focus and lift our eyes these rocks, what they grow strangely dim. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, just thank you. Thank you again for simple, simple power. But it's available to us when we trust in you. Lord, I know there's probably someone here who's facing these rocks now in your life. As we all do from time to time, this message is for those who need to hear it today, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name.